every semester. This is the first one. We'll have another one. I believe it's April, sometime or another day. Okay? Uh, tonight we have uh, an alum, Purdue alum, and this person uh, <coughs> is a dual major, was a dual major from uh, industrial technology and industrial distribution. And uh, in 1992, was a senior at uh, Harrison High School and uh, went through what they had at that time, the ICE program, which go to school in the morning, go to industry in the afternoon. So she started working with Caterpillar as a senior in high school. Okay? <clears throat> when she graduated from high school, started into college, then she was an intern at CAP for all through her college career, and then was uh, hired by Caterpillar, and I believe started in uh, procurement and uh, supply chain, okay? Uh, worked there for a while, and then TRW uh, contacted her and said, uh, we'd like for you to uh, work for us, and went over to TRW in supply chain. Worked uh, there not more than two years, and <clears throat> Ingersoll Rand Corporation called her and said, hey, we want you to come and work for us. So she went to work for Ingersoll Rand Corporation, and when she was uh, at Ingersoll Rand, she would uh, fly to uh, uh, San Diego, and was in charge of purchasing the non-ferrous material, uh, millions of metric tons of non-ferrous material for Ingersoll Rand's division of sledge, lock, and key. And what's interesting is that she's bilingual, and when she went to in charge of plants in Mexico, then she was down in one of the plants went in and she was sitting there listening to the conversation and they did not know that she was bilingual. So they were kind of insinuating, what is corporate doing sending a woman down here to tell us what to do and how to solve our problems? So she sat there for a while and then some kind of a question came up about a process. So she answers them in Spanish, and she said, Dad, <clears throat> this whole thing, atmosphere changed. Because they found out she knew what they were talking about. So when she was uh, uh, still working with, with Ingersoll Rand, Caterpillar says, I'll tell you what, we want you to come back to Caterpillar. Process improvement engineering, working, um, and her, I'll let her tell, her, tell you uh, what uh, she's involved with right now, but going through a lot of the certifications and being Black Belt Six Sigma as one of her qualifications, and also in charge of the certification of processes for the new Caterpillar plant that's being built in China. Okay? Uh, this is uh, Becky Luark, and I'm not sure that some of you already know or guessed it, but this is my daughter, uh, one of my daughters. <coughs>
well known throughout the world what Caterpillar does and what they do. Um, so in Lafayette specifically, the Lafayette plant was opened in 1982, uh, about 1.3 million square feet. Um, those are, that's a list of things that we assemble, and I'll go through a little bit more detail, um, assembly versus manufacturing, because it is kind of important to understand the difference. So those are just model numbers of different engines that we manufacture. Um, or that we assemble. And then on the manufacturing side, we have blocks, heads, rods, cranks. Those are um, all internal components to the engine that um, we'll say are very uh, performance driven. So if those types of components aren't working correctly, you're going to have some major problems with an engine. So if you know anything about engine technology at all, those are major components that uh, we really, really pay attention to. And that's why we manufacture them in our own facility as opposed to having someone else do that. Um, if you guys want you guys to see some of this, this is, this is an engine um, with a gen set attached to it and also a radiator. So many of these are shipped throughout the world. We build probably around 40 a day now, uh, different size engines. Uh, and I'll go through this a little bit later, but many of these are used for electric power generation. And so that's what this is. This is a model of a gen set it's a, actually a 3516 gen set, which means that there are 16 cylinders. Um, it's got a generator and a radiator on it. And these are used um, a lot to power uh, grids. They're used for prime power, continuous power, backup power, um, lots of different things on electrical generation. As I mentioned, the world's source of power. You'll see lots of different applications here, and I'll kind of go through specifically what our plant does. Um, it's kind of hard to wrap your, wrap your mind around, but there are so many applications for these engines. This is a marine application. Um, we sell it to not only our own Navy, but other countries' navies as well, um, making sure that all of their um, equipment is running. We have a lot of our guys who are um, marine certified, and so they go out into the facilities, into um, our customers, and help them keep everything running correctly. Um, I don't know if you know this about Marines and ships, but many different waters across the world have Marine certifications. So you have to be certified to run equipment in that area. So we have to have all of our, we have an entire group of people who do nothing but Marine certifications. So it's quite important, it's a big part of our business. Petroleum applications, this is huge. As we're uh, looking for um, well fracks for, to uh, frack gas, uh, as we're doing oil rigs, as we're doing any type of petroleum applications, gas lines, pipelines, um, we use all of our engines to do that sort of thing. Uh, vehicular applications, uh, some of our engines are, are larger and they don't go in many applications, but they do go in some. This is the largest mining truck that we build. This is a 797. And you can see a little picture down at the bottom. There's, that's a skid steer. So like a Bobcat is the other brand for that. But it's a skid steer loader. So you see how small that is. And those are you know, a decent size. So you can kind of grasp how big that, that mining truck is. So that is the largest one we make. By the way, this mining truck actually has two engines in it. So um, one of those engines, um, we actually take two of them and we put them together. So it's actually 20 cylinders. Yeah, it's actually 20 cylinders to 24 cylinders working all in, in an engine together. A uh, couple, two engines coupled together to make this truck run. So from our Lafayette plant, here's kind of the breakdown of what we sell. Um, electric power is about half of our business. Petroleum is about 20%, marine about 9%, uh, industrial and locomotive, we have a lot of locomotive business, not a lot, 
to do is be able to sell more engines to that market by providing them faster service. You know, if you if we build an engine and you put it on a, a ship to get it across the ocean, I mean, it's going to take a long time. So the lead time, and that's one thing that customers are very dependent on, is lead time. Um, we're trying to shorten all of that by building facilities that are closer to all of our customers. So if our customers are in Japan, if our customers are in Germany, wherever they're at, we want a facility close to them so that we can get them product quickly. Um, it also serves so we can get them um, service when they need it. So if something's wrong, we have service people stationed throughout the world, so we'd be able to get them service as soon as possible. And one thing that's interesting, uh, Lafayette does this a lot, is we have some mechanics that are just fabulous, fabulous mechanics. They're on the floor building engines, um, they're troubleshooting, they test engines, they do a lot of that sort of work. And when we come up to uh, customers having problems, we will send our technicians from the floor. Um, sometimes they know more than our engineers, uh, and, and they work with our engineers, of course, but they're troubleshooting these types of things all the time. And so we'll send those, those guys out to these facilities to work directly with our customers so that they can get their, their problems solved and get engines up and running. We have a, um, and you're probably familiar with this from the uh, mining facilities that you've worked with, but in the mining industry, if your engines are down, if your trucks are down, you're losing just millions a day. Uh, for having equipment down. So anytime that we have mining equipment down throughout the world, that's one of our first focuses is to have people out there fixing the mining equipment, because mining operations are 24-7. So one thing I wanted to kind of talk to you guys about is, I know this is the, the 104 class, so I don't know how much you've had of manufacturing or assembly or processes, and can you guys tell me how many of you have had an internship? Anyone? Good, good, good. Okay, so if you've had an internship, um, you start to see some of these processes that I'm going to talk about. But this is just a list um, of just about every job I've had. <laughs> and the nice thing is, um, with bigger companies, and I'll talk about this later, with larger companies, you can actually move around quite a bit. So in the office, you know, I, I said I, I did an internship and then I went out to the factory. And then um, all of those things listed under supply chain, all of those things are um, you know, supply chain related where you're working with suppliers to bring in material to the plant. The, the thing that's interesting though is you'll find as you move through your career, as he mentioned, I started in procurement, which actually you're, you're bringing parts into the plant making sure that you have material to build with. But then I became a logistics engineer, and in this role, what you do is you find better ways to bring in product. So as a procurement analyst, you're kind of struggling every day, making sure that you have all your parts in, making sure that assembly can build and such. But then as a logistics engineer, you have the opportunity to develop those plans. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Newton used to teach a class on marketing channels. I'm not sure if that's still here or not, but um, those types of classes help you try to figure out what's the best way to bring product in. So I had several projects where um, I was able to set up channels for product that can come in faster. You guys have heard of just-in-time product and inventory reduction, those types of things. So that's kind of what the logistics engineers help do is bring product in more efficiently. And that's really been the case with several of these types of jobs. Um, he mentioned that I was in the factory and I had distribution, I had test area, I had paint, I had assembly. So as a supervisor, you're, you're dealing with the day-to-day, -day, trying to get material out the door, dealing with you know, personnel issues, those types of things. But then you can see under factory management, I moved into process improvement. And moving into process improvement, you can help the supervisors who are there, or the supervisors that are going to come after you, to say, hey, here's how I can make your process more efficient. So you're kind of doing the overall look at, at how things run in the factory and trying to improve those so that it makes it easier for everyone to work there. So I've had several opportunities um, where I've had, you know, I, I was able to kind of get in the, the rat race of the day-to-day -day job and then kind of move out of that and become a, a process improvement person to help the next people going through not have so many headaches. So that's kind of a really interesting thing about um, allowing you to move throughout the corporation. So I did look up um, some of the current classes that you guys have, and I just kind of lined them up with what uh, jobs that I've had and how those classes have helped me. So 
internships, you know, some classes like this, industrial safety, those types of things really help me out. As you move on, uh, factory management, I, I did a lot of supply chain, and really um, supply chain is kind of uh, company dependent. You have to learn their systems. A lot of companies use SAP, so if you have the opportunity to work with any SAP software, a lot of companies are, are going to that. Cat's a little bit behind, we're not there yet, but we are moving to SAP eventually. So uh, that's why it's more, I guess in supply chain, I found it to be more uh, experience related related job, on the job experience, as opposed to classroom work. But, in the factory, all of these types of classes, they feed it directly into what you're doing in the factory. I mean, directly. So, any of these classes that you guys have had or, or will have, you'll absolutely use these in a factory setting. And it's not just our factory. I've been in hundreds of factories, and many of them use these same types of principles every single day. I don't 
undertaking when, when you're looking at that many suppliers and that many parts, because you really have to understand what are you putting on your product, what are you assembling, because any one of those that has a defect could cause a defect in our product when we go to assemble. So it's really important that the make buy decision is there. And you guys will find in companies that you go to work for, um, some of them are strictly assembly, and they don't make anything. They only assemble. And then others are strictly manufacturing. They don't do any type of assembly whatsoever. They um, only produce a, a manufactured part, and that's their final product. So it varies all across the scale from how many parts you're going to make to how many parts you're going to assemble. So uh, these these uh, processes, castings, forgings, fabrications. I'll stop there for a minute. Those have been around forever. I mean, they were probably in your textbook, I'm guessing. Maybe. But they've been around just forever. Then they haven't changed. A casting is a casting, and a forging is a forging. And I'll show you some pictures of these. But when these processes were developed, they were very crude processes to get metal into some state, is basically all they were trying to do. So, in many of these processes, the, the core of them hasn't changed, but what has changed is how to improve those processes to make them better. So as you're working toward 3.4 defects per million, if you're working towards a Six Sigma le level, you have to figure out where those defects are coming from and how to prevent them. So the process itself is the same as it's always been. The improvements to those processes is what, you know, what we focus on in manufacturing to make sure that we're getting a quality. Um, there's a couple other pictures here. We, we do some of this um, when we're manufacturing our, our blocks and cranks and heads. Um, we have some tapping processes. We have um, a lathe that uh, works on our crankshaft. Um, and we have some drilling processes. Obviously, we have a ton of other processes. Um, milling operations, boring operations, grinding operations, um, cutting operations, all of those types of things. And in the manufacturing side, when you're actually, we call it cutting chips, when you're actually manufacturing a part of metal, um, all of those things come into play. And quite honestly, we have, Caterpillar is so big, we have um, experts at the tech center who um, know all of these processes very, very well. Um, many of them are, are PhD level um, people who have studied material and metals and these processes. And when we have problems, we have resources that we can call at the tech center to say, hey, we have a problem with a milling operation or a drilling operation or a boring operation and we need some help. So, you know, if you, if you aspire to be, you know, um, we, we call them stewards, but if you aspire to be something like that where it's very technical and very focused, um, there's lots of opportunity for that if, if uh, manufacturing seems to be your thing.
ways that you cast based on what kind of part you want to end up with. Um, but at any rate, after casting or a forging process, you're still going to have to do some type of machining to do it. Um, this gets it in like a rough kind of state, so you just have kind of a piece of metal that's got some bends or some, you know, um, geometry to it, but it's really not formed in a piece that you can use. So it does usually have to go through some type of machining process um, after a casting. Now, a forging, um, this is what we use for our crankshafts and our camshafts. Um, it's obviously done with heat and force. And um, a couple of pictures, what, what it's showing you there is they take the metal in its state and heat it up and then press and hammer and forge into kind of whatever shape that they want um, to get it to the part that you're going to be using in assembly. Have you guys heard of these before? Is it brand new to you? Okay, awesome. So you guys had some materials background, maybe?
the electronic docks will allow us to regulate. You guys have all heard of the EPA and regulations from the, the EPA. We follow those. Um, we have to uh, recertify every single year, and we have to make sure that we are compliant with all of the exhaust um, for our product that is EPA compliant. So we're using electronics to do that, um, to control those particulates coming out of the engine, um, to control the exhaust, and to control exactly how much pollution or is coming from those. So um, the electron electronics are what is really kind of leading us into the next phase of quality and the next phase of, of evolution with our product. Anyone interested in electronics at all? Maybe? <laughs> it's a really, really good field. Um, as I mentioned, this is just a, a picture of our assembly, and this is, um, you can kind of see, that's kind of a good picture of how big the engine is. These guys are uh, working on the main line. You can see at the bottom, it's actually an conveyor, so those slats are, are moving in one direction, so it's on the conveyor belt. Um, the engines sit on the conveyor until um, the final assembly of them, and then they come off the conveyor and they go into now, in Lafayette, we test every single engine. Um, we bring it up to full load every single time. Um, some engine manufacturers, they do a cold test or they just um, uh, test randomly. But we test everything that leaves our plant. Um, everything has to pull full load and it has to go through um, a 20 minute test to make sure that everything's working correctly. In our development cells, we have research and development cells. Some of these tests will run 85 hours, so we'll have an engine that's continuously running for about 85 hours to collect data on it. And some of that's required by the EPA um, that we test, like ever so many engines, has to go through um, an extensive test. So we do some of that testing as well. That's all done at the uh, Lafayette facility. Does it look kind of big? Does it look bigger than your car engine? Should be a little bit bigger. <laughs> And everything's painted yellow, of course. Um, one thing I will mention also, since this is, uh, since our main focus is assembly, like I said, we only make four parts. Um, a lot of these requirements from our suppliers are placed because we want to make our assembly faster. So you see parts that are, are already yellow, the supplier painted those for us. So when we go to assemble these, um, they've already got paint on them. So that just helps us in our process. We don't, those are just areas that we don't have to, to touch up with paint. Um, we use paint as a rust preventative, obviously, but um, a lot of the things that we require our suppliers to do help us in the assembly operations. So um, you'll find that in process improvement, we're trying, we're trying to build our assembly um, more efficiently. We're trying to be efficient and faster in assembly. And things like that, like a supplier is painting a part for us, that's one less thing that we have to do. So if we find that it's cheaper to pay them to do it than have our guys do it, that's a process improvement idea. So we actually have teams that walk through the shop once a month and then we turn in process improvement ideas, stuff that we've seen um, to, that we can have uh, implemented to make our process more efficient in assembly. Okay, I have some advice for you guys. You may not want to hear it, but I have um, go get an internship <laughs> if you have any time, whether it's paid, whether it's not paid, um, if it's summer co-op, it doesn't matter. I, I remember sitting in um, 104 and some of the earliest classes that I took at Boo, and it was so much easier to relate to what they were talking about because I'd actually seen some of these processes. So the more you can go out in industry and see, even if it's a shop tour, even if, hey, my uncle works at XYZ, go look at the plant, go, go through it, go understand what they're doing. Because um, for me, the more you see in operations, the more you understand how to help. So um, I think an internship is probably the, the best time you can spend um, in the summer or the co-op, or even if you, you know, find yourself where, hey, I gotta take a semester off for whatever reason, go get a factory job. It will help you, I promise. Um, and that's our next line. Spend some time in the not so glamorous jobs. Some of these jobs will help you immensely. Um, a lot of people said, why in the world do you want to go work at the dirty factory? I don't know. I don't know that I do, but I'm going to try 
right anyway. And I learned so much from the not so glamorous jobs. Um, there's, there's been several jobs I'm thinking, oh my gosh, why in the world did I take this? But you learn from it. You really, really do. So um, don't be afraid of the non-glamorous non uh, positions where you think this isn't going to help me at all. They really will. It gets you a foot in the door and it learns you help you. Um, I just want to give you guys a little bit of flavor from working at Caterpillar. This is a, a list, I guess, of anything that uh, we do at CAT. And as I said, I have industrial technology degrees, but I work with people who have elementary education degrees, who have um, you know, bioengineering degrees, ag econ. Um, one of my best friends is an ag econ teacher, and uh, he works in engineering. So there's tons of different degree fields. Um, and in bigger companies like Caterpillar, they really allow you to move around. If you get a degree, you get your bachelor's, they're going to allow you to move around into other, other disciplines. Um, I've been in many of these disciplines. I've never worked in accounting. Uh, I think that's, and I've never worked in marketing. So those are really the two that I haven't, haven't hit yet. Um, I don't think I want to go to accounting. <laughs> So I may skip that one altogether, but I, I do work with the accountants, so I know what they do. Um, I have an understanding of how they have to cost our products and things like that. So I, I have an understanding of accounting. It's not something that I probably will pursue. Um, marketing, I would like to do some time. Marketing is one of those where it requires a lot of travel, though. So I haven't done it as of yet, but um, just so you know, the bigger companies, they really allow you to move around, and it's kind of independent of your degree. So it's, it's really whatever you decide to do. There are people, I know many of them, who spent 40 years in the same job. They like it, they don't want to do something different, and that's okay, you can still do that. But in some of the larger companies, you have so much more opportunity to move around and do different things. So think about long-term and flexibility. Um, like I said, one field versus a ton of fields. If you want to move around and get lots of experience, in fact, um, our general managers, they uh, have to have, we have a uh, profile at work that has different uh, departments that you rotate through. And for you to become a higher level manager, you really have to have an understanding of any of those departments. So they really stress that they want you to move around so that you understand what, what all the other groups are doing so you can manage at a higher level. Um, so one of the things that, um, Cat kind of stresses is overseas. So um, overseas opportunities, with Caterpillar being in 200 different countries, you have a lot of overseas opportunities. I can sit at my desk tomorrow and bring up every job that's open in the entire world. And I can see Singapore and China and Germany and wherever. Every job that's open in the whole world I can see. And we're, you know, you're encouraged after talking with your supervisor to put in for those jobs if that's something that you'd like to do. So um, moving overseas, a lot of opportunity in other countries if you're working for a big company. So uh, you kind of have to maybe take the good with the bad. And that's why I put a couple other things on here. Networking is really important. Uh, as you get to work uh, in, in different facilities, you get to know more people, so expand your network. Uh, one thing I'll say that I don't like about a big company is there's a lot of bureaucracy. It seems like the larger a company gets, it's kind of like the government, you know, it kind of becomes more and more out of control. Um, I know that, that Purdue kind of does that. You get things in committee all the time, and we do that sometimes at work where you go to meeting after meeting after meeting and nothing gets resolved because of some of the bureaucracy. So I think in smaller companies, that doesn't happen as often. It still happens, but not as often. Smaller companies, usually there's a small group of leaders who make the decision and you can go forward and you don't have kind of the red tape, bureaucracy, corporate rules maybe that, uh, that we have to go by. So. Uh, a couple other things on continuing education, as I mentioned. Um, it's really important if you're looking towards a master's degree, if you're working for a company, I strongly suggest that you look into what they pay um, to get a master's degree because it's a huge, huge benefit for you to have someone else pay for that. And with the companies I worked for while I was getting my master's, um, they allowed time off to go, you know, do 
Mentors, I don't know if you've done any mentoring yet, but one thing I've kind of learned is how a mentor be a mentor. And when I was uh, as an internship and as uh, a young, fairly young person just starting out at CAP, I would find people who knew um, the systems well or who knew a process well or who were well respected, and I would ask those people questions so they were my mentors. And then a few years ago, people started asking me questions, and I'm like, well, why are you guys asking me? And I'm kind of looking around like, oh, I'm not the youngest one here anymore. So you kind of move into that role of, oh, now I'm the mentor. Um, I give a lot of, um, I give a lot of talks to um, specifically women in technology and engineering, um, talking about how to kind of uh, get into some of the male-dominated roles and and how to work with uh, more male-dominated disciplines such as engineering. Um, I think in our in our business at Lafayette, I can count about oh ten women in engineering, maybe maybe fifteen. to be print 
without the engineering degree. Um, so that's fine for me. Uh, I'm where I want to be, so it doesn't really matter. And I can go higher in another discipline. I can go back to supply chain or operations or what have you. But like the, the girl who sits beside me, she has a uh, master's degree in mechanical engineering. And so she could do some of the things in engineering that I possibly couldn't do. Um, does she use that? Not really. It, it, it's funny because I just asked her just today, I'm like, hey, can you look at this print with me? And she's like, oh gosh, a print. And I'm like, you're an engineer. <laughs> this should be your thing. But so I mean, more theoretical. More theoretical, yeah. Definitely more theoretical. And if you want to go that um, precise, you know, technical route where you want to give advice on mechanical engineering, um, then that would be the way to go. I haven't found that I needed it, just in my own experience. Anything else? We're right at 9 o'clock. How's it? Is it how it is? Okay. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty stiff, actually. Um, we're struggling to get into some of the uh, markets that uh, our product is actually too costly because we're a premium type product. And so some of it, they want a lesser uh, cost. So Komatsu is one of our competitors. Commons is 